launching Nerdist Book Club with Maud and Rachel. We are covering The Three Body Problem. Uh, this is a book that I should have collected from my bedroom and brought with me because I have a physical copy of it for the first time. Uh, but if you're joining us, a big hello. You could be watching on Geek and Sundry's Twitch. You could also be watching on Nerdist's YouTube and Facebook page. We love talking books and we want to talk about book discussions. Um, we want to talk about what you're into. We want to have like a little bit of a, we're coming into the holidays. What kind of books are you into situation there? If you're a first time chatter, say hello. Let us know what you're currently reading, what you're into. Um, and then a big hi to all the familiar names and faces with Tim and Chris. Uh, hello, hello, hello. And Jay Buntrock. Oh, my two favorite co-hosts, he says. We love that. Um so while, while we wait for people to come on through, Colleen's here. A big hello. It says it makes me happy, Vaden. I'm not sure what Vaden said, though. We missed that one. Catch22 Catch says it's my first time chatting here. Does that count? In the Twitch? Yeah, you betcha. I should think so. Um, Zupine says Three Body is my favorite book series yikes because what we've noticed already in the discussions that have been taking place on a discord is that we've been very split about this book um so rach how just how are you how you been how'd you find sci-fi we haven't done sci-fi since not recursion but dark matter by blake crouch oh dark matter yes which was and uh you know mm -hmm. i struggled to book mostly for reasons i struggle with any a certain kind of book where if there is so much science that's one and obviously like i think um get intimidated <laughs> by hard science because i never did well in in science um i also did dude i dropped out as soon as i could <laughs> yeah me too i did um <laughs> but um also i think into it at the beginning and sort of being like I think I, the parts that I, I really, I got more into it as it went on and as there, like, as there were more, more like the science, fic, the actual science parts that I thought were really interesting and cool. I was saying before the show, um, with, with our, uh, illustrious media, Lee, uh, uh highly behind the scenes that with some books that we love, I don't super have the I read it necessarily even if I can tell like this is works of it that are really good but in going through through and like doing notes and refreshing my everything and looking at it like, like from that perspective I end up liking it more steps because of like mm. what it's trying to do, even if I wasn't necessarily there to interpret it as, as I was reading it um so even though I with reading this I do kind of want to like re I never do this, but I want to read like breakdowns of the other books because I find it really interesting. But of reading it was hard, for tough. Me. Does that make yes, sense? yeah, it what sure does. Now we weren't here last week because we were celebrating an American holiday of Thanksgiving, so we weren't able to do a halfway check in. But it's interesting to hear the difference between the first and second half of this book. Miss Necromancer says, I found the first half slow but interesting, but the second half just flew by. I guess that's because the first part was more theoretical and explanatory to set the scientific scene. And the second half was just the aliens meme. Um, I actually found the first half to be more exciting than the second half. I found the first half to have a thriller element that I was like, whoa, why are scientists of like an academic level wanting to wanting to kill themselves? What is happening? What is this future? And then when it kind of took you into the, the three-body game and then it started explaining the science, I was just like, you had me, then you lost me. Uh, Piling saying part one was boo, but part two was coo. It's interesting. <laughs> like, yeah. So I guess the first question that I have for everyone is, did you prefer the first or second half of the book? Was book good? <laughs> what did you like about the book and what was kind of holding you back? Lisa, who doesn't rarely not finish a book, says I only made it to 38% before I quit. And Zupine saying I the first say, book's not the best. Yeah, yeah. I think for me, more so the set, honestly, like the, the middle, like from 
like the beginning I think is it's just hard and you really and me I think the way that it's written is is really interesting to kind of there's so it's so philosophical not just in terms of like theoretic, theoretical science um but like the philosophy humanity of trauma of um scientific press and um you know and the the kind of trip issues with being so applied that you're only looking at around you and also being so big picture and that the like human cost um it's it's a little mocky it's sort of like the ends justify the means and of like the technological the advance explanation and the future worth whatever this um so i feel like that element of the beginning we feel for um uh i read this one so ye yay the main character did anyone listen to it the first protagonist I have forgotten already. Yi Wen Shi. Yeah, yeah. Oh, the um, but just kind of go her introduction and everything that she went through and how that has shaped how she views humanity in the world to that point. And then we, you know, jump up for for decades and get put in this thriller, this thing on that. Obviously, it's super my favorite part. Um. But the game, which I think, um, you know, there there are other stories set in many in you know kind of virtual reality type sci-fi stories. But the the mystery of figuring out what the the, the actual three body problem, but also the sort of um, phil again like philosophical moments happening each time he went back in and was in a different era and was meeting with. Mm -hmm to like encounter actual historical um and just the ego of some of these science in in the vr also actual burn um, him story. um i know ben. <laughs> oh, um sorry dude's trying his bit burn him now <laughs> burn him um but i do think that like having like stuff with having galileo in there and sort of the all of the references and sort of looking at history and politics and religion and how science can get politic politicized how science and really used to like control people um and and just that when um when wang sh uh saw realizes that the three stars or the suns and, and those things his uses in with is copernicus who like discovered some of those like a lot of things in there that again once I like researched more um all kind of came, mm. came more together and See, the pain argument. was reminded me of my first that I can recall ex existential panic attack at age like 10 when I see the movie contact with my dad I've talked about this on the show before when they're sending the messages is out and there's the they're like get sounds back and i just the like brain thought of we're so tiny in the universe oh my god what could this and i had to leave the, the theater <laughs> tells you what kind of 10 year old i was but it's that's like the point of the scientists is that it's so much of it is about full science about numbers about predictability and when you have an unstaotic thing you cannot predict and you know these aliens are basically like gasping from space yes. <laughs> you know like breaking science on earth and the science don't like if if even the basic pillars of what we see of the universe don't actually make sense or are can imagine it's just this idea of like it's too big it's too much our brain equipped to handle it and i found that really interesting as well <laughs> fair enough uh we are going to go into sort of favorite characters people have been weighing in if the first or second half of the book is better or worse 
Uh, before we go into that, though, while while everyone rates the book, says the book's good, we do have a little bit of news. We're going to tell you at the top and tail end of the show, just in case you miss it or you got to scoot, because it's a bit of a big deal. Yeah. <laughs> we are in November of 2022, and 2023 is going to look and feel quite a bit different. Um, Nerdist Book Club's original original um, start was called Alpha Book Club and we launched October 2016 uh, with Hector, Rachel and I uh, behind a paywall and we did that for quite a long time and then when Alpha kind of stopped, we were like, what are we going to be? I love how people are predicting what this news is going to be and trust me, I'm going to drag it out until someone gets it. Um, we had a little bit of a hiatus before you came back as Nerdist Book club uh, and we've been doing this for the last few years online that's been really really amazing uh it's just nestled in nicely with geek bombs book club because it means we'd got to do two books every single month which is great and since we've been doing this show we've really developed such an amazing community and we've loved <laughs> Rach, interject anytime you like we've loved getting yeah. to know everyone we've loved uh, everyone's opinions. We love seeing the same names show up every single week. We do this. We love the fact that we had our after show where we were able to have a cameras off real raw discussion about a lot of these things. Um, it's been a lot of fun, but Nerdist is kind of changing things up for 2023, Rach. Yes, we are. So we are no longer going to be doing the Nerdist book club after this month. Um, and I I don't even have words. I think like I, I'm an emo, I'm an emotional person. So I'm sorry. We're Pisces. I just I just <laughs> we're Pisces. Because I know two of us together, it's just yeah. tears all the time. But <laughs> I am like so proud. Book club has meant a lot to me, like in my personal life. And I met Maud through this show. And best thing that ever happened. <laughs> Best thing, and, and like when we were doing Alpha Book Club too, there I was. I mean, everyone goes through stuff, but just like consistently over the six years, um, um, Wednesdays have been the highlight of my matter. If I'm having a, a you know a bad day, and we do book club, and it changes everything. Um, but meeting Hector and Mod, who are two of the like people I know like truly oh, the best humans you could hope to know and and i like pitched the show no idea not thinking i would be host <laughs> i don't know if you can tell. but um they are part of it and i was extremely nervous and that first time we've talked about it before but that first um episode in october of 2016 when we did uh the haunting of hill house by shirley mm -hmm. jackson and it was that first episode and we cut it and it was just like did this for like the end really special it really was a step brothers moment so yeah. they're to share on, on mods end the community is not just nerdist book club. We are, we're on, on hiatus um but i just want everyone for tuning in with us and for a show that's about books which i you know don't often get the same kind of attention in digital media and, and places like this that we've been able to do this for so long, um, I think is a huge accomplishment. And obviously thanks to everyone that tunes in. So um, little, it's, uh, we love you. And there's also some more news as well. There is. Um, Notice Book Club has been amazing. It's been a small team that's done big things. And I think it was always ambitious to try and center a show around reading books. I mean, it's more of a neglected area of entertainment uh, in comparison to film, TV, video games, all of that. Um, so the fact that we carved out our special little place, our home, um, to have accountability, to have a community, to be able to share, and to, my favorite thing, have different perspectives. Um, I've only ever been reading books through my eyes and I only take what I know from it. So to have, and I've always say this, we're all reading the same words, but we're all getting a different story. And to be able to have that place to hear your perspectives, <clears throat> my turn now, <laughs> to teach me things like Machiavellian, <laughs> 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 
to read genres that I had not really delved into before was really, really important to me, but also having um, vulnerability within a community to share their thoughts and perspectives and, you know, to learn more. And I love learning. So Nerdist Book Club, I think, started something so special that when it did have a bit of a hiatus, I was like, right, I'm not stopping reading. <laughs> I'm going to keep yeah. going. Um, Geek Bomb's initial book club was back in 2014, actually, um, where I would get the author of a series that I absolutely loved on for a long form discussion with fans of the book. Um, and I thought that being able to provide that scope between author and fan was so important as well when it came to, you know, tell me all about your characters. I'm in love with them. They're the best. I would die for them. Um, but then it became about the community, which was really cool. And Geek Bomb over the last couple of years has definitely focused more on the community. But there's big news for me as well. <laughs> Notice as news. Geek Bomb has news. I have made the decision to focus solely on one lane instead of Geek Bomb trying to cover everything in PWR, playing, watching, reading, which has been a very difficult thing to do. And the growth of the company has reflected so. And so it really kind of prompted me to look in and say, what, what's working? What do I personally love? Um, where's my passion with all of this? And it was the book club. So start, <laughs> starting January of 2023, Geek Bomb, after 10 years of being a company, 10 years of Geek Bomb, 2023, we're actually going to rebrand and be Maud's Book Club. So we're going to have a whole new logo. We're going to have, um, we're going to be focusing on being hopefully that that nourished little corner of the internet where we get to talk about books. Um, we're going to be getting authors on as well. We're going to be bringing that back in. Uh, December's book, because we have no Nerdist, we're going to be covering Murderbot books one, two, three, and four. And I've already locked in Patrick Rothfuss for four ah. hours. <laughs> Two lots of two-hour streams to talk about books one, two, three, and four, <laughs> MBC. Um, and so we're just, I, I'm really excited to know what this looks like if I stay in my lane and actually pour all of those resources into one thing to make it the best that it can be and for it to be incredibly special. Um, <laughs> Thierry's saying one book a week <laughs> for Murderbot, yes, for the rest of it. That's it, ambitious. Um, this one, I would have pulled my hair out. <laughs> I needed time. For so this one, I read the first half of this book three times and the second half, I couldn't even tell you what happens because I was like, meh. So that's the big news. We're going to be announcing this publicly uh, for Nerdist after the show for Geek Bomb tomorrow. So you found out first about Geek Bomb's future. We are going to be doing a massive overhaul with what that looks like um, and we're just going to be the – yeah, your your favorite little book club that exists. And so yeah, excited to see where that will all go. There are going to be changes with Geek Bomb as a company side of things with Patreon and Discord and all that kind of stuff, but that's not today's conversation. We got to get back into this sci-fi book, yeah. But also I want to say uh, this is this was the thought process while I was also listening to what you said was a caring member of Mod's book club and then I thought would you make cards <laughs> like a library card? Oh my god! You I know love I that. Could play library as a kid, and no one would play with me. <laughs> I'd oh, bring I love up. that. I know that Amanda's in the chat, who's basically community managing all that kind of stuff. So we we're going to do bookmarks, but I like library card. Like literally, you are yeah, a member yeah. of the club. Yeah, yeah. So That's I will be really a member and tuning in and i'm so excited to see every just for everyone watching uh i know you know this because you are fans of, and all of that but she worked so hard and is so smart and gives and i'm really excited for you um and everything that you want to do and you have obviously my support my militant support um but also, and also you know the whole community so yeah i feel like you. i'll be able to finally breathe 
So there you go. There's big news. We're going to be, we'll chat about that at the end of the show um, again, just because we want to make sure that everyone <laughs> knows about the big news. Um, yeah. Yeah. We're going to miss Nerdist Book Club. There's been iterations of it. Yeah. It's not, it's not great news, but it's also good news too. So we're just, yeah, we're softening the blow with like, exactly. you know, exactly. There's no still book going anywhere. Club. There's still a great book club that are going to like manage and everything that you're doing uh, you know so much of the community did stick around with geek bomb and through geek bomb as well so it, it's really nice to and also nice to have the show and and you know have the community that words as well just like and and i agree with you too about genres and perspectives you know mm. between you you me and hector you know when we were first starting out and like learning about each other through how we run. It's just like why I love, love stories so much because I just feel like this one, even though it was like very difficult for my brain to like not a fault of the writer, any stretch, just like it's cool. And if I take that all in at once and get it all, then I think it would have been less of a chore. But, it, but thinking about now, people's backgrounds and little political like elements and the human elements of stories is like is my favorite thing. So the fact that we've like gone with it, like not only are we learning about ourselves through reading or from other people's perspectives, but also about each other. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's been lovely. <laughs> So I just read Miss Nicarez's <laughs> comment of I want a bookmark of cartoon mode running with girl. <laughs> she go. <laughs> so maybe, maybe yeah, I'm definitely, gonna, I'm definitely gonna I'm definitely gonna drop in and also oh, they're getting nerdist. Just the book club, I swear. We're still here. Just the book club. <laughs> we are because we are in exactly. a bit of a chaotic era. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but it, lovely. It, great it, great a chaotic, what have we been in? Hold on, is that what is that booze in your hand? No, it's water. What is it? Oh, I was like, oh, I will go. I will take three <laughs> steps and grab a drink if we need this. If we need to get a book for that. Oh, okay. So there we go. We've uh, laid it on you. We'll go over that again at the end. But um, bringing things back to Three Body Problem. I mean, let's talk a little bit about what the truck this book is. Hey, it's a <laughs> science fiction novel by Liu Chishun. Ch Ch I looked it up last time, and I think I nailed it last time. It's the first novel oh, wow. of the Remembrance of Earth's Past trilogy. Now, this book, which everyone is saying is the weakest of the trilogy, which I think is so fascinating because usually the first book is the one that hits the home run, and then the, and it's almost like a self-contained book, and then it's like, oh, I should probably write more. Um, it's not often that like a whole series is planned out in that particular way, but the fact that this is the one we've got to get through and then it's going to get better and better. Is it enough for me? Don't know yet. Um, but it was originally serialized in science, in science fiction world in 2006. It was published as a standalone book back in 2008, and it is now one of the most successful Chinese science fiction novels of the last two decades. Um, it was translated only into English by Ken Liu, uh, published by Tor Books in 2014, and it's become uh, the first Asian novel to ever win a Hugo Award for Best Novel. Now, someone in the comments previously said there was a lot of hype and the book didn't quite pay off to the level of hype that we were, you know, that we've heard about this yeah, particular it, book. It, I remember it, saying that George R.R. R. Martin. Oh, sorry, what was that? Oh, I was just saying, yeah, when you look at it, it's like this is, and it, it is very, like, fascinating sci-fi, but I think it's how what you, you, what you connect to when you read and and what interests you, I think, too. Oh, I just said, Tamsie said, your Mandarin uh, phonemes sound, sound on point. What is that word? How do you say it? Phonemes? Yeah. Yeah, I sound so good. I studied Chinese. We were made to learn it from when we were 9, 9, 10, 11, and 12. Whoa. And so I still have the. Yeah, hold on. I used to be able to say, Nihal, one, how's your Yep. Uh, 
We do want to have a little from bit of a trigger warning point. with this one. <laughs> what? No. Never mind. I mean, I was like, that sounds good. And I was like, to my clearly very experienced ear. <laughs> of, like, <laughs> I was like, why gold star. Yeah. Um, there are trigger warnings for this one, especially suicide. It does talk a lot about people taking lives. And so if this is a sensitive topic, just a heads up with that one, we will treat it with respect. Um the trilogy, though, portrays a fictional past, present, and future where Earth encounters an alien civilization in a nearby star system made up of three sun-like stars orbiting each other in an unstable three-body system. So with all of that, uh, we are kind of thrown into a character's backstory, how we learn about Ye, um, Ye Wenxi, Ye Wenxi, Ye, Ye, Ye Wenxi, Wenxi, yep, I'll get there. Um, and why she is so important with this revolution and how it's kind of spanned decades and her journey and you don't really know what's happened so we've got to go back and then it's current day so there's a bit of a time jump um with all of this though how being thrust into this world how did you find it because i'll be really transparent i read the first half of this book three times for it to really sink in and there's parts about it that i loved and the parts about it where i'm like you know what three times and i still don't really get it i'm out so how was it yeah. for you? Um, I, I liked the beginning because I felt, well, uh, even just the first few pages, I sort of, it's hot, it's like my brain sometimes with, I ran into this with high when I was younger, where like if there is, my brain needs to know what information is necessary of like world building or name or, or set up in general and if i'm thrown above names like dates immediately i feel like my brain is like oh i don't this already for too much which is yeah. like because yes. <laughs> so i yeah. like i'm already thinking like need to know um so starting it i was like oh goodness but once we got into sort of the the layout or the kind of backdrop Chinese cultural revolution and all of the um all of the sort of political unrest and um targeting academics um and just the intro with her father and the students and everything that was happening that really drew me in because though i'm certainly not an expert on uh the history of generally not um, um, I think in general, thinking about um, the way that, like I said before too, that government, religion can, can all tie together and that often in regressive things, uh, you see, you know, obviously marginalized communities are often targeted and uh, we see that all across the globe still, but other ways as well the science itself academics because any this kind of theory thinking that something is that seems impossible is possible having these sort of like understanding the world around you all of those things uh any kind of population understand if they are controlled and so you see it mm. uh now there is a there are just huge huge or, or throughout the pandemic these attacks of doctors nurses scientists who were literally saving lives and there are so that all just felt like i can i felt like i was like okay teeth into that i was like i don't know how that <laughs> science fiction um and then it kind of then it sort of slowed down to me until we got to um sort of contemporary times but i do think like you guys know like a main character who goes through something hard hard and then i can like view their that like sets up who i at least meet character wise and i found her so fascinating because of the trauma that that she went through and what she witnessed and all of the betrayals she she goes through just in the first section um, mm. and her kind of views as a scientist and just really seeing her 
you know, resurface later as, you know, a, an older character and kind of like what's going on with her and then realizing that she decided, you know, like all of the different choices that she made because she was she got to the point to see the good in humanity anymore mm -hmm. and all of that was like enough for me to sink my teeth into and then sort of dropped off what about you so a couple of things actually i somehow wasn't really retaining or getting a lot of information about the chinese cultural revolution that information wasn't because i was trying to focus on the science part of it um, what did they discuss about the cultural revolution? What were the big significant parts of that? If you've got a dot point. Oh, it's, it's, oh, I don't know if I'm eloquent enough to, but just kind of the, um, communist regime, um, got it. kind of, yeah. So it, it's similar to, to, um, was having the cold, cold war as well. And I think like what what's interesting about or well, one thing that's interesting too is wang kind of gets to the secret organization initially like nato china america in the 60s together that like i feel like of certain ramifications and like the actual philosophical like yang i think is a very 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 philosophical character and the way I think about the science is more was more understandable to me like they're talking about the um the sons multiplying and folding on themselves i was like uh, and i was like okay what this means is that they're scrambling particle accelerators so like any kind of like physics level my brain was more shy then I'm fascinated by particle uh, <laughs> colliders because I they could unmake the universe at any point if something were to go wrong, and it happens. Oh, it's, good! Just a little yeah, simple black hole that will work matter in all these particles, yeah. and it's this. It's like <laughs> it's like Lovecraftian gods or science to you know Galileo at the time, where people think it's witchcraft that like things seem impossible because we don't understand them yet and so now there's so much we don't understand about the universe and like all of that so to have i i find that fascinating because i like old beings and stuff i just i just find it weird and interesting like what if you know their dimension ever it would be in science i don't know how but next to us that like operates completely differently or when aliens why do we always assume they're going to be humanoid when it could be yeah. any, you know um so yeah um i will also say that it's like uh he dubs, i'm sorry I, kp dub 71 discerning people are into part particle colliders cern is the name of uh, the most well-known uh, particle collider that's in switzerland well so, done well yeah. done uh, good on you ken uh ken's multiverse person is kevin <laughs> that's an in joke sorry <laughs> um i will also say that we're talking sort of about wenji's life and how you know she saw her, her father get murdered in front of her she's um was was imprisoned the government was against her they wanted her to sign a document to witness something that she didn't see and she stood up for her own values in that particular way and so like she lost she lost faith in humanity but when given the choice to betray an entire fucking planet and civilization she one person made the decision on behalf of billions to give up this information so my question to the chat and to everyone else about our main character Yi Wenji is, is she a villain? How would you classify her? Because she's our main, is she a protagonist that becomes an antagonist? Is this a story that lays in sort of fact? Or is there an, an opinion that you could kind of pass into this where it's like her, she started getting the whole greater good, greater good headspace. And it was like, at the cost she's a classical purist says piling 
Yeah, oh, there you go. That's my answer. Thanks, bud. <laughs> I yeah, my answer would be uh, the whole book and sort of the all the different themes in there about all of that is that uh, there's no real answer to it because I several of of these characters are and someone in the chat was pointed out as well uh amanda very interesting that both mm. characters who betrayed the species didn't find they had value as an individual and i think there's definitely um you know that idea of that I, I think is very relatable on the level of you know if you've watched say the good place and they sort of reveal that no one can get to the good place anymore because every choice world is built in such a way that anything you do is probably can do something bad in any it, buying your tomatoes from a certain place and like grow those like things like that so that the world is so big or looking at climate change and this assumption that individual changes are going to make the difference versus the you know number of companies companies that are putting out most of those emissions and all those things so i think the idea of institution can't like and being in a repressed institution and having this trail and that, that the, the kind of guiding for life of science of of good um it's kind of all thrown in your face when you're that young and this just huge system thing do i support her no and she did kill her husband like i don't think she is good Ray bunt rock says she's evil murdered her husband didn't even have one thought about it one way or another it's just a means to an end i think that level yeah. of detachment that level of in, you know it's a sociopathy it's it's not having empathy it's, it's not it's and I think making a decision on behalf of everyone and thinking that you know best and you know what is right. Mm. Um, Ms. Necromancer well, says she was scientist. We've talked into the, not, not all science, I'm not, not I'm disparaging all scientists, but I think like it a lot in Into the Drowning Deep too of this, um, yes. this quest for yes. knowledge, but also this At like- what cost, yes. And also the idea of under, like, if you stand things that maybe other people, like you, it, I should fuel thinking that you know better because you know so much more than the average person. But even when you look at the Trisolarians, yes. that I can remember in this brain, that's three sons, tumble, tumble. Wow. Um, that they have been trying to build a civilization chaos and they can't ever get to the, like they can't civilizations because every time they're making any progress with terror, all these things, they get a chaotic phase or everything solved to be dehydrated or maybe they all get wiped, burned. Eradicated. Listener yeah. tried to warn, he tried to warn and she was trying to like, but they both like, like um, the commenter said, they bolus. But, but then the civilization that does evolve for the tree calorians that do, does get to a point where they have like a, a sort of UN in a more modern place. And they are only reason. So they don't care about, about a whole other world. They don't, um, but of our, the, the, the what happens when you don't have any lived in or that kind of, you're not thinking about things all level because you have to just make it happen. I think that she is made a lot of bad choices and is not a good person. Um, and I, that she, I feel, I feel sad for her too. Mm. I feel sad. Um, but yeah, she's not a good person for sure. Yeah. It's, you know, if it gets to a point of so being so bleak, I don't know. I'm listening to another book at the moment where it's like no matter what situation or circumstance, doesn't matter how sort of like parents were, it doesn't matter what your neighborhood was like, at the end of the day, you have a choice. Um, and if you choose to sort of harm 
that's Agreed. still a choice that you are making. Um, yeah. And I think in this situation, it's like, you know, I understand, like, it is very understandable why she's like that. It doesn't mean that no, it's she not should okay. be making the decision. It's <laughs> not an excuse at all. To yeah. eradicate the human no, race. Yeah, 100%. Like, when we look at, I feel like she's, she that message and then lives her life for a long that and like reconnects with her mother and then immediately has an experience like nope that's not happening again um yeah. so i think like it that one choice is a domino effect that is completely out of her control after that like she participating in doing terrible things but once that happens and then people find out and and it just all it falls into this huge collection of you know these these versus um redemptionists um but it's like it feels like the all the characters in this feel are basically learning little control they have when the actual like building the you believe you know how they used to function isn't even function but also referencing like einstein in the game how sad kind of he is and and thinking about his work the horrible <laughs> horrible deaths just completely you know this thing that he wanted to be you know technologically forward in some way used for such destruction and you kind of wang feeling that as well with his like nano sliver which reminded me of ghost ship i'm so sorry to because it's serious but if anyone's seen ghost ship just it's there's a scene with like a Y. Ooh, uh, got it yeah. uh, it reminded me of that um but yeah i think that they all are feeling powerless as they're learning like Seemingly that it's inevitable the tri Solarians are going to come and take over. Um, and so having her as this like this character once was hopeful, then humanity wanted to burn everything down, started to live more, you know, then down finds the religious aspect of these pieces. Um, but it, it feels like a theme for everyone she just uh takes it super super far yeah and then becomes the mouthpiece of the trisolarians to help destroy science on planet earth uh because yeah, earth is finding its technological feet at such a rapid rate and it's i thought that that was really interesting like the concept's fascinating there is a planet with three suns that fucks with everything and instead of having a progression rate that is a scale that does like ages like that and then it goes vroom, like that it's doing this mm -hmm. and it can't well it's actually at this level and it can't ever achieve greatness over a length of time because it eradicates like it implodes it it wipes itself and starts again mm -hmm. and, I, and that was really interesting and it's like a little bit of a warning of like how long we have been on this planet and for a very long time we were stuck in an age millions of years we were stuck in a particular age and then getting to sort of like um homo sapien and then the industrial revolution and then the, the age of information like it's ha it's it's what's taken millions and millions of years is now taking a couple of hundred Mm -hmm. um and that's you know how fast it's going on with that nanotechnology able to build sort of these elevators that you know and satellites and all of these things that can take out the trisolarians as a species um vaden had an, an issue earlier saying there's a problem with any other extraterrestrial species being better than humanity having a better moral compass or being you know um more decent and if there is a choice then it shouldn't be mankind that's an interesting conversation that i'd love to have in the after show 
uh, when we talk more about that. Uh, but another conversation that happened earlier in the chat, uh, Miss Necromancer, you had brought it up as well. And it's something that really stood out to me, these biases that are uh, happening with how this is being written. The one that bothered me was the academic bias. We are going to talk to you, the intellectual, as an intellectual, about science, and we aren't dumbing it down, and we aren't spoon feeding it to you. And so if you don't get it, then guess what? You're stupid. And that really is quite a strong tone in this because I felt it and I was like, cool, I'm going to zone out for 20 minutes while you figure out saving the planet. Um, <laughs> but the it was very much the this is an elite situation. We are um, brilliant minds and if you are under that, then you actually have less worth. Pai Lang said, yeah, they were straight lecturing. Um, I feel like if we have a global problem, then the best thing to do is get everyone to fucking understand it instead of it being like, well, if you can't understand this, then, you know, you don't, you're not privy to it. Uh, I have read other science fiction books that have explained science in a way that was super difficult but really palatable. I'm going to bring yeah. up the best book we read for Geek Bombs Book Club January of this year, um, Project Hail Mary. What a fantastic book. It is talking about uh, astronom like astronomical, no, astron astronaut, astronaut space travel um, and what it takes and the science involved to have gravity uh, mixed in with sort of more physics and testing geodes um, mixed in with I, I literally have to do a maths equation to find out what angle at what speed. And mm -hmm. everything was done in a way where me, the girl who dropped out of science at 15, understood yeah. everything that was happening. And it, yeah. I believe it is the duty of the author, if you're talking about a subject matter and you want your audience to get it, I understand that like with themes, with character nuance, all that thing, spoon feeding can hurt the book. But when it comes to understanding a technicality, we need to be able to understand that. I appreciate early in the book when um, is it Don Wang's uh, boyfriend, he's freaking out, he's drunk, and he's trying to explain why the collapse of science is so important and he's using a pool table. I'm like, thank you. You've yeah. provided a visual understanding. You've explained to me in layman's terms what this all means and why it's a problem. And that's why the first half of the book was better for me. And then they got into just literally textbook shit. And I'm just like, no, nah, yeah. that ain't going to do it for me. Um, and Kate says, Dai Shi is just peak. Just do it, you nerds. <laughs> yeah. In mood. Yeah, no, I got totally. a little and Tone of that. And I think, like, part of why I struggled with science was teaching teachers with that tone it, it was like uh, not ever you know just think certain people like I used to always think like wow it's wild that people always say they'd rather take a test than write an essay because that's we're talking not. less than right brains here right and this and is the so thing brains are beautiful but they work in very different ways Tim's here exactly. going science isn't hard and I'm like mate you tried to describe to me what mass was in what mass in space was and I tuned out <laughs> like, yeah and I think someone uh I will always say nerdist uh alum uh who has his own amazing channel um his show because some Science that he did with the Nerdist. He now has um, everyone should go check it out. He is so smart, but he also would each episode because science. When you watch it, it it deal much science and math that normally I would would be gone. But he's able to do it in a way that does make sense to a science dum dum like myself, self proclaimed. Um, and I think that like yeah, it's a skill. Um, good point by someone in the chat of, you know, potentially the translation as well could mm -hmm. add to that. But I, it's also like, how do you explain quantum physics to people? <laughs> I don't know how you would even do that. Maybe no. I'll be curious. But it, it, it was quite harmful in this bias that they're presenting because it also fits in with this story um, exactly. about sort of like the, the best brains being able to understand 
the three body problem, uh, you know, who's attracted to the game, who's progressing in the game. I think there was like one journalist or a writer, I think it was a writer. And I was like, yes, oh, right, brain. <laughs> There's one of us in the, the mix. The humanities are never, ever important situation, even though critical thinking, media literacy, anyway, don't get me started. But Yeah, um, right? Empathy. No, <laughs> like, talking about sort but of I like people, cultural impact. Yeah. I, yeah I, one thing that I thought like, also for their cost, like the experience I had during the movie content. If anyone's seen it, you're very silly that the part that I, I got freaked out by was being noise from space. But anyway, um, that concept of like tiny universes. So when the tri um, Solaris people are trying to develop their like photon mm -hmm. weapon to space, and they're having these conversations about like, hi hey Zelda, did any you know, is there any life, you know, costs or anything like that? And they're like, well, you know, there was sort of like Earth that was created in that photon that's now gone. And it's like, even the one they end up creating, and there's this conversation of, is it alive? Well, it didn't. And it, it mm. like ties also into Evans, right? Yes. Who's um, the partner the billionaire. and experiences with his father shaped him to care about preservation of all life almost at the expense because humanity has done so much to destroy um, our planet and the beings that live on it and all those things. But I thought that reminded me of, um, or like Men in Black where the little universe is on the cats. Yes. Uh, right. That was really Felt. well done. That idea that freaked me out as a kid also, so, like, what if I accident a universe in a pebble and then I stepped on it? Like, the concepts are all so fascinating. Fine. I'm definitely going to, tonight, go and look up the full breakdowns of the other two. I want to know, like, where it's going. But I don't think I'm going to read the other two. I'm not. I also, <laughs> no, I don't know if I will. Uh, I also but noticed the bias okay. between... Sorry, I said I'm glad what? people enjoyed it, and I parts of it and thinking about it. Yeah, I was championing this book until the halfway mark, and then I was like, "Man, I was reading for you. You just didn't tell me how to think better." Um, the other bias that I noticed, because this is a Chinese book, is the difference between Eastern and Western. Whether it comes to science, mm -hmm. whether it comes to um, how we've progressed as as nations. Um, Kate brought up a really great comment way earlier saying like, you know, have you heard about the microwave? Oh, yeah, those lazy Westerns are just going to chuck a bit of food in and nuke it up and it's hot in the inside first and uh, actually sounds pretty cool. Uh, but uh, <laughs> we don't like that. Um, and then the, the differences between sort of like, you know, the CIA or like the American um, authority coming into it and then also in the game um, these the genius and using mythology or using sort of like, you know, it's myth History. to try and, yeah, to try and depict or to predict um, what's going on with these three sons um, and having sort of like the, I think it was Galileo who was just absolutely shitting on Eastern things and it's like, no, it's trial and error and it's all about collecting data. The way that the narrator in the book made Galileo sound, no, that's not how we do things around here. And it's just like, okay. Well, also, seeing... like, East, the Eastern uh, scientists did discover things a lot sooner than the West. So found it interesting that the Adventists who want the, um, the aliens to just like wipe out humanity are from the western kind of contingent and um redemptionists sort of a, a buddhist adjacent and inspired kind of mentality of maybe they can be, show us how to be better which would be if i were to join a side obviously my side would be don't invite them here Passive it's okay fine. we're okay we 
that. No, just don't, don't come here. Sending messages out into space. Why are you doing that? Yeah. Why are you yeah. opening? Cool, to, man. Why, are, why, why, are, why are we doing this? I, I'd be like, uh, for planet that's got three suns, maybe it could be cool. <laughs> <laughs> Mm. Um, so that was interesting. And then the last one, which I thought was a really interesting analogy, which takes place closer to the end of the book. And it's sort of, again, it's Daishi. Daishi, uh, Big Shi, he's very, very brilliant at reading people, but he's not an academic and he doesn't get the science, but he gets people. And he does it in a way that can be heartless sometimes, but his biggest strength, and Kate was saying it's his, uh, she's, it's her favorite character in the book. Um, but yeah. again, it's like using sort of these metaphors and using these analogies that anyone can grasp. And that was the locust and the bugs analogy where it's like, you know, uh, he, there were locusts, I think, in this in the science lab. And he was like, wait, what's the difference between Tricellarians and humans as humans to locusts? And it was like you just he sucked the air out of the room basically saying that. And this whole analogy is that even though the Trisolarians are going to try and kill Earth and humans, just the same as on planet Earth, we have bugs. And in every single room, there's bug spray and we are constantly killing them. We're trying to eradicate them one at a time, but they're always still there. And that's sort of like the mentality that mankind and humans are going to have towards the Trisolarians. It's like you can try to kill us but we're always going to just be there. And it was Chris earlier who said that our planet Earth in this current day has just, I think, the eight billionth baby has been born in our population. Mm -hmm. um, and Colleen chimed in and said, that's a lot of bugs. <laughs> yeah. It's very funny. No, and I, it, it's true because that's the mentality you have to have if you don't want this knowledge of earth's really unstoppable demise you have to have to find hope it's in some way also i'm interested to, to find out what happens in the other books because part of this is all centered around the fact that you can't predict and you can't understand everything so even saying that it's inevitable how do you even know but i very chilling to me when they they were talking about it and they realized that the Trasolarians probably had just had been listening to the whole time because they had been talking about bugs before and and they just went like you're bugs or whatever and i was like they've been, <laughs> they've been, been a full chill and i was like i want to know what happens here <laughs> that, mm. that's mm. like oh you have literally just been watching us try to figure this out that's that's scary to me. Mm. Um, we wanted to have a little bit of a end of year wrap up as well. We all kind of uh, we weighed in on this book. We gave it something out of five. What did you give this one out of five, Rach? Uh, I gave it a because I think it is a good good book. It's just maybe not for me. I'm exactly the same. Like Three out of five for yeah. me. Glad I read it. Don't know if I'll continue with the series, even though I yeah. heard it's better. But that's mm, that's a little bit tough. Um, some of the questions that we, we want to do in our end of year wrap up is: What's your favorite book that you've read with Nerdist Book Club? Which one's been the best? Uh, Rach, over to you. Which one's been your favorite book this year? We should sort of revisit. Now some I want to flip this up, and, and then now I'm like, oh, what did this year? Um, it's hard. I have to like think about it now. Uh, just I really enjoyed Vicious. It's a little biased, but that that's a good one. Um, I'm looking at the I really playlist. Yeah, there you go. Let's read mm -hmm. some some names out. I my favorite book club moments of all time is from the archives on Nerdist YouTube was we read The Princess Bride. Yes, okay. I interviewed Carrie yeah. Elwes. Oh and God. then for the last episode, we brought in Carrie Elwes to um, talk to us about his memoir about the book. Oh, and that's a fantastic question, Maud. 
And he, we, I mean, we all lost our minds, but us, that mod who is always, I, it was the fun, it was the fun, and I, some of the biggest Princess Bride fans on the planet. Yes. And we kind of thought he was going to come in for maybe like 15 minutes of the show and do it mm-hmm. the whole time. Whole hour. He sat whole with hour. us. He was so loved into our eyes and he said, that's, that's a good one. I was going to see, but I had read that before, so that's cheating. Song of Achilles, but he would you'd have oh, to go well, well, mod. That's a great question. Here's yeah. this, and it's just I fucking how it. carry your name out loud. It has it magical powers. Yeah. Um, some of the books that we've read this year. Are you ready? Dark Matter, The Lies of Locke Lamora, The Night Circus, The Sandman, The Wheel of Time, The Eye of the World, The Dark Descent of Elizabeth Frankenstein, Final oh, Girl Support one. Group. I think that was last year, actually, wasn't it? I liked that. Um, the fa- foundation oh. trilogy, no, we have um, also no. Circe and um, Song of Achilles. I think Song of Achilles was my favorite, um, yeah. big time. We are going through the archives here with Thrawn, Dark oh, yeah, Tower, yes. yeah, um, Haunting of Hill House, Golden Compass. Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, oh, Jurassic God. Park, Name of the Wind, Gone Girl, Star Wars books, American Gods, oh, my- um, Harry Potter, we did the entire series, Mexican Gothic, His Majesty's Dragon, Lovecraft Country, mm-hmm. uh, Bloodline, Black, we- uh, Black Leopard, Red Wolf, didn't like that one, Dune for a lot, The Hobbit, plenty of books in there. But I will say that, yeah, my absolute favourite was... Song of Achilles. That book, I wept at the end of oh, it. Oh, Cemetery it. Boys. I loved Cemetery Boys. Good one. Song book. of Achilles. Dune, I loved. That had been like a bucket list book for so long. And like the fact that I oh, actually yeah. really enjoyed it was great. Um, Dark Disciple is great. Mm-hmm. Um, someone mm-hmm. just had one that has now escaped. Oh, um, Mexican Gothic. That yeah. sent me on like a deep dive of like gothic or romance like, like subverting kind of those tropes or like in a place or like getting real weird with it and i've read so many help because i was like i want to yay read a million books yeah. i read horror because of this book club something that i, I thought i would never do yeah like did gothic. Want to... i did like gothic, gothic yeah boring. very sexy it was good. Exactly. We covered lots of Star Wars. Exactly. We we covered um, yeah many genres. I I think the most disappointing one for me was when we did a Amer- uh, no Assassin's Apprentice. It was a fantasy book that was on my to to read list for a very long time, and then we read it, and I was like, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I know Same it always sucks before. when you book, and then you're like, oh. I like that a little bit way back in the day. Good book, but. Interview. I hadn't read Interview with the Vampire since I heard, and we did that one, and I was like, "What a oh, slog!" Right. This was, and the, the adaptation, the movie, uh, the, the only existing adaptation of all besides the Vampire was that, like, she screenplay and condensed a lot of the things that in the book maybe didn't need to be there, and I was like, because I would have really wanted Vampire Lestat, which she wrote years later and had like grown as a writer but you kind of need interview to go anyway so one where i was like sorry yeah <laughs> yeah but it was great and like I, I don't think i would have ever read uh jurassic park like the book and that was a lot of fun i don't know it was really really great but we we read john carter because of hector but then i made you read name of the wind and Liza i like name of the wind so. i like name of the wind I know. I still I really do I'm going to read the second one, but I feel like I, because it's the it, third one isn't out, I feel like I have time. Mm. All right. Well, we'll have yeah. to just add that to the list. We've got quite a big list happening for Maud's book club. Hey, yeah, oh we've almost God. got like the whole, the subtle knife. The whole year. We and we've got knife. authors that I've already um got like interest from so yeah it's going to be a lot of fun speaking of that though we've got a cheeky half hour that we're going to drop on by to our final after show of the year this is where we're going to just talk shit 
because uh, no one's going <laughs> to no, no, no. Uh, but join us over there. This will be the last after show that we are doing. This is the last time we're going to have this little secret group that it will not be recorded. And then coming December, a reminder, we are doing the Murderbot Diaries, the first four books. They're really, really short. They're like novellas. The first two are going to be the first, the December, the 7th, and then the 14th of December we'll be covering the second two. And an amazing announcement with that, Patrick Rothfuss, is, um, he said it back in March when we had him on the show for, I think, Name of the Wind, that he would come back on yep. to talk about the Murderbot series. And he has honoured his word. We're going to be getting him for both of those book clubs to talk about the murder, uh, the Murderbot novellas, that series. So get the first four books if you can. Uh, join me in December 7th and 14th for that one. I'll be taking the rest of the year off because I'm going to be in Australia. Um, in fact, I think I'm doing one of the book clubs from Melbourne in a hotel. But, yay, this is what we got to do. And then next year, yeah, we're going to be doing um, a book a month and we've pretty much already got the first eight months <laughs> sorted. Uh, so it will be there for you. But thank you so much. Sorry to drop some um, not-so-fun news that Nerdist Book Club, this is the last book that we are doing for Nerdist Book Club. It is a, a six-year reign um, of talking books with you almost every week. Uh, the best thing that's happened uh, to us, Rachel and myself, I can speak on behalf of Rachel, it was amazing to yes, have met you yes. through this and gotten to know you, but it was also amazing to be able to chat books in this capacity with such an amazing community and looking forward to seeing you all over at Maud's Book Club. Uh, you can join the Discord. Lee, just pop that in the chat uh, if you look at Nerdist's post um, and we'll make sure that we can kind of have a nice little stream so you don't miss Nerdist too much and that we've got a home for you over uh, with a book club there. Long live Machel. <laughs> 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 truly long live um and yako um what we said earlier show thank you to the whole community for um for joining us on wednesdays studio at home home during the pandemic with wine we wine. used to pop a bottle in episode <laughs> oh, oh man the ones in the that studio was... if you go one sometimes we are like <laughs> no, i i one of us were like onion or Hector. All the gifts, so many good gifts. Um, so, just want to say, like, thank you for for joining us. Going anywhere, obviously, but we support support Mods Book Club. Anything in this community, I'm still a part of it. Um, so, thank yeah. you for reading books with us. She's our secretary. And uh, and I'm um, just gonna say, Nerdist Book Club. Very good. Yeah. <laughs> Club good. <laughs> Club, Club good. Very, uh, very. We'll see all the members in the after show. We won't be seeing you here anymore, but all of the Nerdist book clubs throughout all the years are all available on the YouTube page. If you haven't given Nerdist YouTube a follow and a sub, do that right now. You can follow the playlist. They're all there uh, if you do want to kind of virtually read along with all of those at your disposal. You absolutely can. Rach, it's been an absolute honour. Lee, thank you so much for joining us through all of this and the gifts that you've made um, and being just wonderful with the support. And even though she's not here, Ali, a big shout out for all the technical stuff that you've done as well. Yeah. What an amazing team. This is a goodbye, but uh, not... Wait, this is so long, not goodbye. It's not farewell. I could have stuck the landing better. Anyway. <laughs> Bye, everyone. See you Bye. over at the Discord. We'll see you in the Discord.